Good morning to all of you and uh, welcome back to the GMO Academic Power Program. Uh, today's uh, lecture is on stress. Are you stressed? Uh, we have invited Dr. Chapuri Suravira uh, to discuss about stress. She is the senior lecturer in psychiatry, faculty of medicine, the University of Colombo, and she also is honorary consultant a psychiatrist at National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Chaudhuri Suravira graduated with upper second class honors from Faculty of Medicine, Colombo in 2005. Throughout her psychiatry training, she achieved remarkable success, earning two gold medals in psychiatry. In 2013, she completed her MD in psychiatry, uh, ranking first in the order of merit. Her dedication led her to pursue overseas training in the United Kingdom where she became the inaugural trainee worldwide to be selected for the prestigious medical training initiative program in psychiatry. Dr. Suravira obtained her board certification as a consultant psychiatrist in 2015. So let me warmly welcome Dr. Chaturi Suravira to GMO Academic Power Program. Over to you, Chaturi. Thank you, Charuni, and thank you for the introduction. And thank you for all the Council of the GMOA for giving me this opportunity. And today I thought of talking about stress because everybody keeps on talking about stress, that I'm stressed and they are stressed and there's so much of stress. Uh, so that those are the kind of words that are there in everyday practice of most of our doctors. So um, let's see what stress is because most of the time in our practice as psychiatrists we feel that although uh, our doctor colleagues come to us saying that they are stressed, sometimes we feel that it is actually not stress that they are experiencing. Uh, it might be depression or anxiety. So being medical people also, we have kind of felt that, you know, that um, there is trouble recognize what stress is and what not uh, is stress. So let's see what stress is and also in my talk today I would be talking some strategies to reduce stress and uh, relevant to our work as well as the family life because most of the time as doctors we come across stress because of the work life uh, because of work-life balance, the problems in that. So there are issues in the work as well as issues in our home which creates stress. And sometimes the important thing is we generate stress because of certain things and practices that we do. And there are simple things that we can do to avoid that. So um, with that introduction, I'll go to my presentation. Right. So. So when it comes to physical health and mental health, because I thought I would introduce the two concepts, we all know that health is not merely about absence of illness, uh, but it's the state of well-being as well. So how much of time have we dedicated ourselves to really think whether we are in optimal physical health? and optimal mental health. I get the feeling from what we gather from our colleagues that we are doing certain things like exercises or uh, controlling the diet to maintain the physical health. Because we know if you don't maintain the physical health, that might predispose you to have problems like diabetes or ischemic heart disease. But um, do we pay the same attention to mental health. Now, if I ask you whether you know your weight, whether you know your BMI, the uh, body mass index, most likely 95% of the time you would know what your weight is, height is, and also your what size you are. Uh, so, but if I ask you what about your mental health, would you be able to give an index or an indicator to so say that, okay, yes, I'm happy, yes, I'm sad, I'm anxious. Other than at times where you're feeling really sad or really happy or really stressed. 
so that itself is an indicator that we are not paying attention uh, to our mental health and also if i ask you the second question what have you done to improve your mental health just like uh, whether you have done exercise or tried getting a membership of a gym or tried re reducing your carbohydrate intake. Whether if I ask you what have you done to improve your mental health from your previous status to now, most likely answer is no. Uh, because we don't know where we are as opposed to physical health. Because as opposed, to, I mean, when I mean physical health, in physical health, we know, okay, we are BMI is this much, so I have to do something or the other to reduce the BMI. Or um, you might think that your arms are a little bit uh, uh, having more fat so that you need to do some exercises to the arms. So in physical health, we know up to that extent. But when it comes to mental health, you might be stressed and you might be like, you know, feeling very much stressed at home. And when your kids and come and like, you know, grab your arm in the afternoon when you get home in the evening. And uh, when you say that you must be just like, you know, eatable and asking them, I to in the call. You just wait, I'm really tired. So that then, that's an indicator to say that you're stressed. But have you done anything to prevent yourself from getting irritated when your kids come and cling on to you when you get home from an on-call. So just think for a moment whether you have done anything. And also, let's say for an example, now somebody comes and asks you for an on-call exchange and you're feeling kind of awkward to say no, but you know that there are certain things happening which might be a little bit tricky for you to take over that responsibility. How many times have you got into a stressful situation because you have accepted this task, uh, because you were not assertive enough, which made you stress? So that's how important mental health is as well, because just like in physical health issues, mental health issues is not only create problems for ourselves, but also to the others as well. So coming on to the topic proper, that is stress, that is a major determinant because as I mentioned earlier, mental health is all about mental well-being and it's not about mental disorders or psychiatric disorders. So when it comes to mental well-being, one of the major things that would tip the balance in your mental well-being in day-to-day -day life is stress. So let's see what stress is. So we tend to give it sort of like an abnormal status when it comes to stress. Like you know we tend to denote something abnormal that is going on in our life when we say we are stressed. But Having said that, let's say there is an exam coming up in three weeks time and if not for that exam, that alarm bell would not be there in our body. Now there is an exam coming up in three weeks time so I better get start study. So there is a, an alarm coming up in our, coming from our body saying you have to now start studying for this particular exam which is coming up in three weeks time. So that kind of triggers you to start studying. And if you have been do having a tight schedule, that would make you make some time and take some time away to study. And that would make you grab your books and start doing things. So is that the bad thing? That's absolutely needed. Otherwise, if that alarm did not go in your body, you would be taking it very lightly and you would be doing your day-to-day -day routines just as happily as it was and to find that you have not studied anything and you'd be, trouble in, you'd be in trouble when it comes to the exam. So that is what stress is, which means it acts as a driving force and 
it does a productive thing it drives you to achieve a certain goal which is nearby so that's why a certain level of stress is not abnormal it's actually normal it helps you obtain certain go goals so that keeps us uh, alert and motivated and the stress response which comes with that alarm helps us our body to adjust to new situations and it prevents danger because the sympathetic system is in full uh, activation now so if there is a dog and if our stress response is not activated you will be just sitting there until the dog bites you it works as a driving mechanism so that's why stress is important and that it's actually productive now there is a bad side of it but most of the time if stress is experienced in an adverse manner usually you might be depressed you might be having an anxiety disorder and that might have detrimental effects so in general if you are feeling stressed that's okay as long as it helps you to achieve the goal that you need to achieve let it be an exam let it be getting prevented from a dog bite but let's say this this stress level that you are experiencing 3 weeks before the exam is not helping you to study and is giving you sleepless nights but you haven't studied a single page which means you have not been productive and you are so stressed that you are irritable at your husband or the partner or the wife and the kids and you can't concentrate no matter how much you study nothing goes in then that has not done what the stress is supposed to do which means you have to seek help because unlike in the stress that i spoke to you earlier that has not helped you to achieve your target which means you need help it might not be stress after all it might be anxiety it might be something of a mental health issue which needs help now for example some people when they go to the exam they panic and they have this uh, sympathetic overdrive they what they come and say is i went into this sort of a stunned state or oh, my mind went blank so obviously there's something wrong the anxiety has been so overwhelming that the person has not been able to achieve what the person has to achieve so then it's not stress because that has had an adverse effect so don't label it as stress and be home or continue to live your life like that because there is help available and you have to seek help it might be an exam phobia if you really get into it it might be a generalized anxiety disorder which needs treatment and also if treated can be controlled and you could be very much functional so any uncomfortable emotional experience uh, accompanied by predictable biochemical physiological and behavioral changes so the sympathetic drive is there so the physiological changes of slight heartbeat increased uh, then the uh, slight changes or in the sleep wake cycle so the biochemical is the noradrenaline is working there would be a certain amount of dopamine in the system uh, and uh, this is a condition or a feeling that is experienced when the person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize so that's why the abnormal aspects of the stress comes in because there is a certain amount of emotional strain and tension there so we do certain things like studying like time tabling like getting the books in order to prevent this becoming from an overwhelming experience 
So the stress is there, we do certain things, so then that helps us to achieve the target. There's a small technical issue, all right, okay. Uh, so, how do we feel when we are stressed? Because we need to know what exactly stress is in order to identify this. Aches and pains, chest pain, of like a feeling that your heart is racing, exhaustion or trouble sleeping, dizziness, shaking, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, some people want to go to the toilet before the exam. So if it is not having an impact on sitting for the exam, don't worry about it. There is a certain level of stress, but it's under control. So you should not deter, one of the take home messages is don't worry with stress. Because if it's not having an impact with your day to day life, that's fine. Poor attention and concentration. But let's say I'm emphasizing again, if the poor attention and the concentration is not helping you to study and you're not remembering anything, then don't label it as, stre as stress and keep it aside and struggle with your work or the studying or home life because that definitely needs intervention because it's impairing your functioning and the quality of life. So that's why as medical professionals, we need to know how to recognize stress, how to label it stress and what is not stress. So the easiest thing is to go by the functioning and the quality of life. What are the stressors that we might experience in day-to-day -day life? Transport difficulties, long waiting times, not knowing about the outcome, and starting of the faculty as medical students, starting as the first year registrars, starting, at, starting work at one place, like, you know, a new place. All of these are stressors, but that stress has not worked adversely for us, isn't it? When like, let's say, uh, there are transport difficulties, we feel the stress, but then because we are aware that we need to be there at eight o'clock and we are running late, we think and we to do things in order to prevent us from getting late. And at least we would get there by eight five. But if we don't do anything about it and just wait for the bus or whatever to come, then no stress, you're not going to meet the target. So that's why I said that it's productive. So this is the biochemical chain. These are the biochemical changes that's going to happen. So I'm not going to go into detail because most of you know what this is, but there is a biochemical basis. So that's why it's important to know that there is a biochemical basis because when it's overwhelming, after a certain level, it's not under your control. That's why I need to focus here. Uh, I want you to appreciate the fact, sometimes we think because it's something to do psychological thing, it's something to do with the mind, we tend to think that even us professionals tend to think that this is under our control. But why it is not under control is explained by this. Because after the biochemical cycle ch takes charge of things, then it's beyond our control. So that's why it needs help. That's why sometimes we have to give medications when stress becomes anxiety, when stress becomes depression. Because just like when we can't control vomiting, you can't control feeling sad when you are depressed. And depression might be the cause for the stress because in normal day-to-day -day life, we are able to take a certain level of stress. But when you are depressed or when you are having generalized anxiety disorder, we have used all our coping mechanisms. We are really tired. So we don't have the energy to counteract the normal day-to-day -day stressors. So two months ago, the same working environment, the same boss would not have made you stressed. But now, because you are depressed and having anxiety disorder, the same level of stress would make you depressed and anxious. Purely because of these biochemical changes that are taking place. So that's why sometimes we can't control it ourselves. 
So when it comes to stressful events, there are three components. One is unconscious, which is the defense mechanism. For example, I got scolded by my boss in the morning and I can't scold back at my boss. I go home when my child comes and clings on to me. Kela, you get irritated at the kid. So that's the defense mechanism. It's unconscious. I don't do that purposefully. But then I was stressed at the fact that my boss scolded me uh, in the morning. I couldn't scold back. So I took it out on my kid. Or most of the time the partner. Or sometimes the pet even. So that's unconscious. We don't do it purposefully. Like, you know, if we knew that I am stressed because of the fact that the doc, uh, that my boss scolded me, and if I knew that I should not be letting it out at my kid, I wouldn't have done it. So it's unconscious. And there is a conscious mechanism, which is called the coping strategy. Now, let's say sometimes when we are really stressed, we cry. So you cry for a while, we know we do that consciously and then the stress level goes off. And sometimes we go and talk to one of our friends and we tell, tell and then you offload that. So then you feel less stressed. So that is something we do consciously. And then there is the emotional response. Sometimes we get sad, sometimes we get anxious, sometimes we get angry. So these are the three responses that you would experience when there is a stressful event. So when it's a threat like the dog, it would be the anxiety that the emotional response would be. And when it's a loss, it's going to be the depressive state that's going to be. Here I'm not really talking about depressive disorder or anxiety disorder I'm talking about the response here because there are certain criteria that you have to meet in order for us to diagnose depressive disorder or anxiety disorder this is just the stress like the dog comes you feel the anxiety if like I have not passed my exam I would be feeling sad so that's the emotional response not necessarily the depression then the coping strategies could be it could be problem solving. So you look at the problem that is making you stressful or because it's the emotions that's going to uh, bother us, you do something about the emotions. So those are the coping strategies that we can use. So um, which I will be talking about later on because that's going to be very, very important because this is particularly conscious because sometimes we might not have control over the defense mechanisms which i mentioned earlier like the displacement you displace the anger which should actually be directed at the boss towards the kid so let's see whether we can do these things that i have mentioned here and also whether we are doing it sometimes when we are stressed and there is a problem obviously there's going to be a problem that's why you're feeling stressed um there's a problem like let's say too many shifts so there's a problem and uh, there are young kids at home so you are feeling stressed so the problem is too many shifts and you have to balance it out with your home environment so that's the problem and when we are sort of engrossed in our problem without sharing it or without doing anything about it, we tend to look at it with a very tunnel vision. Like we tend to look at the problem the way we want to look at it. Now I have seen um, like you know certain our colleagues they are very much stressed if they have to like you know during the covid time particularly they were stressed because they had to do covid duty let's say the covid duty is two weeks time so now because of the little kids or your parents who are at home you are kind of reluctant to do the covid duty or go visit patients in the uh, covid ward and then you initiate a process to sort of like you know uh, to get you exempt from this particular covid duty let's say the covid duty is for two weeks 
you proceed with the uh, with your requests and everything and along the way your head or your senior consultant or the in charge MOIC is also like now getting stressed and we are all trying to sort it out it might go up to the level of the director and this two weeks COVID duty, the stress of two weeks, get dragged into about an inquiry level and up to about six months. So that one place that we have sort of created stress. Trying to reduce stress, we have created and prolonged the stress that we are experiencing there because sometimes when you are looking back, it would have been easier to do the two weeks COVID duty. Just an example, because sometimes we are in that kind of um, corner thinking and perceiving the problem that the way that we want to see and you have not looked at the bigger picture and also how much stress that is it's generating on the long run. And sometimes you end up getting depressed or anxiety disorder as well. So looking at the bigger picture and obtaining information and advice and sharing your problems with trustworthy few people please is very very important. This is not to be like I'm not asking you to tell it to everybody and share it with everybody. Then it's going to be a big mess. And solving problems. So you have to focus on how to solve this problem in the most productive manner, which reduces stress in the long run. Because sometimes certain things that we do, it might increase stress level in the short run, but reduce in the long run, like the example I gave you with the COVID duty. Now, and also now let's say, um, uh, for an example, we, when we were like about 20, 21 medical students, we have this plan like, you know, we need to uh, become a registrar at this age, consultant at this age, or we have our objectives. Like it could be like, you know, having a very good private practice or being a very good general practitioner or being a very good researcher, right? But then, that is when the goal we have at 22 years of age. But just think for yourself, when you go up the ladder, at 22 years, we did not make any consideration about kids and what might be coming like the petrol issue or the COVID issue. So there might be delays in achieving our goals. But then later on, um, when you compare, okay, this person has become what he or she wanted to be. This person has this big car and this big house. And then where am I? A lot of people sort of tend to compare. Now you're feeling stressed. The uncomfortable feeling that you're feeling when you think of your, these things is stress. That is really stress. There how do we reduce the stress? I can tell you not to compare things, but then as human beings, that is going to happen. We are actually comparing and getting stressed without knowing the circumstances of other people. Let's say, now I have made the choice to have what I want, and let's say to have kid, kids now, so then, when I look back, it's me who chose to do that. And I have to take the responsibility for having the kids while knowing that it's going to delay my postgraduate process. I have to take the responsibility for that decision I made because, okay, now with the kids and everything, I might not be achieve be able to achieve my goal of ha having this so-called car. So if we take responsibility for the decisions that we have taken and also understand that although we are comparing with the others and trying to, they also must have done some sacrifices and they are also might, might be having certain things that they have lost in their life to obtain the fact that I am 
uh, grieving about, then the stress would be reduced, isn't it? Because let's say I have lost that car, but that person who has the car might have sacrificed something else. So we are comparing and we are getting stressed over something without knowing the facts. Okay, and okay, I could say that obtaining information is good, but we can't go into pry into other people's things. But we have to come into the realization that there are things in other people's life also which is happening which we are not aware of, and so there's no need for us to get stressed about. So living in the present moment and appreciating what's positive in our life. For example, we say that. Uh, we are like really stressed out because there is so much of work that we need to do. When we think like that, we are going to focus only on the work stress and we are only going to focus on the work colleague who is not punctual. But we are doing this job. What are the positives? We know that we get a salary at the end of the month. We know that there are certain things we are obtaining because we are doctors which we don't realize when we get stressed about the negative things in our life and we don't focus on the good things and the positives. So remind yourself all about all of these because there are hi-fi sophisticated strategies that you can do to avoid stress but these are simple things which you can do in your day-to-day -day life. So moving on to emotion reducing coping uh, coping strategies, talking to another person as I mentioned earlier. And positive reappraisal, like I mentioned earlier, like in the problem solving, what are the good sides of this? That itself, okay, it's like really bothering me that, you know, I have to work in this tight uh, duty roster, but thank God I'm getting my salary. So that bringing in the positive aspect of things is going to reduce your stress and going to reduce your anger, anxiety or the depression that you are experiencing at this moment. See, these coping strategies are there with you all the time, 24 hours per day, 365 um, days a year. I did not ask you to go to the gym. I did not ask you to go for a dietary regime, which is like, kind of difficult at times but these things in your day-to-day -day life is going to reduce your stress so let's be let's talk about maladaptive coping strategies because these things are also prevalent among us use of alcohol or unprescribed drugs now let's say sometimes because of stress you might feel a, a little bit of poor sleep you might experience that and what do we do you take a little bit of aprazolam and if that is not stress and if it goes on to become a depressive disorder you not only have depressive episode but also benzodiazepine dependence and alcohol yes on the short term it will reduce um, your anxiety or the stress but what will happen happen tomorrow and we don't know after, it's only after a certain level that you actually experience the effects of alcohol. But at lower levels also, concentration impairment, attention impairment, the problems with reflexes which might predispose you to have um, accidents are there. Although you don't know that. Deliberate self-harm, yes, there is deliberate self-harm among us as well. Those are very short lasting and it only leaves the scar that you remain with the problem. Let's say it's because of a relationship issue and you cut yourself or take an overdose. Yes, still the problem is there. Added to that, there's additional stress of taking the leave, telling, uh, telling your boss as to what the cause for the deliberate self-harm was. All these things, the stigma, discrimination, so added stress. Unrestrained display of feelings. People tend to get angry when you're stressed. Aggressive behavior. 
so those are maladaptive coping strategies so if you know that you are a person who becomes irritable or angry when, when you're faced with a stressor then if that is the persistent pattern because people tend to have persistent coping strategies and if that is the way you need to seek help that's not a mental health disorder but for getting angry you need to do something some anger control mechanisms if continuously you're taking alcohol because you're feeling stressed every day then you might end up become dependent on alcohol you need to do something about it <coughs> so what are the psychotic sequelae due to stressors it can be variable and multifactorial because if I'm generally an anxious avoidant person the more chances of me becoming stressed more chances of me ending up with depression or anxiety past experiences because multi hit theory uh, like you know a lot of stressors would add together and then at one point you might end up with a mental health disorder so that's another reason that you need to the, focus on stress relief so that's why you need to reduce the stress because continuous stress as i mentioned at the example that i gave like you know when one was trying to sort of uh, get her her or himself excused from the covid duty there were multiple stressors with which added to it which ended up in depression or anxiety <coughs> So these are the things that you might end up with. <coughs> Sorry. So that's why managing stress before everything happens is very, very important. And also, yes, stressor can, stressors and stress can lead to mental health issues. Also, when you're depressed, when you're having substance use disorders, then exceptional stressors can make you more stressed. So it has a bi-directional relationship. Mental uh, stressors can lead to mental health disorders and people who have uncontrolled mental health disorders tend to perceive stress more. These are also linked to stressors. And it can precipitate. Like let's say I am vulnerable to develop schizophrenia. A stressor can be the starting point. So that's another aspect or a dimension which falls. So stressor can lead to mental health disorders and if you are having a mental health disorder that can in increase the or change the way you perceive stress and this can act as a precipitant also. Now as I mentioned earlier people tend to use this word stress as a blanket term but if um, you're persistently feel sad if you cannot engage in things that you used to do if you are having difficulty which is like you know paying attention and so on for a, more than let's say about two weeks that is not stress and also you are feeling stressed and edgy and in the background if you're having any of the symptoms and signs that I mentioned earlier the problem that you need to target and change is the depression feeling sad lack of energy lack of uh, interest in usual pleasurable activities poor sleep poor appetite that's depression if you're constantly worried about this and that and everything and all the time like you know you're feeling edgy having poor sleep and sympathetic overdrive is there and you're feeling stressed that's my that might be the thing that you're experiencing but that's not stress, that's generalized anxiety disorder, which needs treatment. So how do you sort of differentiate 
stress, feeling sad, because we all feel sad and we all feel happy, we all feel fearful. That's where sometimes we get really confused. Now let's say there is a death of a loved one and you feel sad and after some time it resolves. That's a normal response. You're supposed to feel sad in that situation. You need to get yourself checked if you're not feeling sad. But let's say there is death of a loved one and you're feeling sad. There's no energy to work, not interested in the usual pressurable activities. It's not resolving and there is functional impairment that is depressed depression. That means that you have gone beyond stress or sadness or whatever and that's depression. I am emphasizing these things because even though we are exposed to psychiatry, there are a lot of gray areas and I see a lot of people calling themselves stressed but to see ultimately it's not the stress, it's the depression or the anxiety that is bothering them and making them functionally impaired. You might be fearful of dogs, so you avoid dogs, so that's the response. It's okay, there's nothing wrong with it. You don't have to love dogs all the time. But let's say just seeing a dog 100 meters away and like, you know, you're not like getting to the car which is parked nearby, that is not really appropriate because you're not going to the car because of the fear. And there is an impairment in your day-to-day -day functioning. You might have to wait until the dog goes away and which will make you delay to your next appointment. So there's going to be a problem. So there's avoidance, there's unnecessary fear and the response is exaggerated. That is phobic anxiety disorder, that's not stress. <coughs> And if that feeling of worry and apprehension, the feeling that you get at the sight of a dog is there all the time throughout the day, <coughs> that's generalized anxiety disorder, which needs to get treated again. So a little bit about depression, because they are very, they go hand in hand. These are the symptoms of anxiety. How do you relieve stress? <coughs> exercise. Okay, when we say exercise, we tend to think about going to a gym or like, you know, getting all this attire and like doing it properly, which never happens, right? But have you ever thought of like, you know, instead of um, taking a, let's say, a three-wheel or something for a short distance, where like you have to always get down at a particular pace, place and the rest of it, you're too lazy to walk, you take a three-wheeler. That's the place where you can introduce some walking. Even a short walk can boost your mood. And also it's good for your physical health as well. Because exercise has evidence to improve your mental health, physical health, as well as relieve stress. At the end of the day, just like what I mentioned at the start of my talk, have you ever taken a moment to think of what you have accomplished because we tend to lament and grieve about the things that we have not achieved most of the time. You might be thinking I have not done this particular exam or how I have not done this particular car but in place of that you might have got a bundle of joy two kids or something like that. Are we appreciating the things that we already have? which would relieve stress and give you a great deal of pleasure because we tend to focus on negative things most of the time which is going to make you stressed. And have we set any goals for our day, week and month? Because 
looking at the long distance thing now let's say if we go to the bottom of everest a uh, mountain and look at the top of the mountain you are going to get stressed and very much overwhelmed because it's so tall it's like it's the highest mountain but if you look at the next step that's going not going to make you that much stressed so just like that yes you need to know that the everest is the uh, goal but let's look at the next step that's going to take away a lot of stress out of you okay for example you want to be a good doctor first you need to know what a good doctor is and what you call when you say a good doctor and then that is there somewhere but then you take the next step you do your duties properly today you talk to your patients nicely you uh, work in collaboration with your colleagues so that those are the things that i should be doing today in order to be a good doctor let's say at 45 or 50 or whatever because good doctor seems so vague and so big as opposed to doing things that needs to be done today which is going which is not going to create much stress in you <laughs> talk to people these are the things that you can do talk to the parents or to a friend a personal tutor and so on but not to everybody because sometimes talking to too many people is going to make you more stressed Remember there is 1926 helpline and also there is a helpline by the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists which you can talk to over the phone. So when it comes to relaxation to prevent stress we tend to think of yoga meditation and this thing. But Now let's say most of the time if you think that you know what your what is your hobby most of the people would say scrolling down the facebook is one way to reduce stress but does it actually reduce stress when you go through the facebook you look at i mean theoretically speaking it might be but then practically speaking people are going to put the best photograph and the best moments in their life on facebook and here you are lamenting about the fact that i am not having the luxury that this person is having when that particular person has chosen the best picture available uh, to post and that's making you stressed so scrolling facebook is not a way of reducing stress use that time to listen to the, some music because sometimes if you really monitor it just monitor how much time you uh, spend on social media it's rather much much more than what you think you can actually if i ask you whether you have time to grow some flowers you might say no i don't have time but if you use that time to actually do some gardening you might be able to uh, do some proper gardening during that time let's say if you install an app you come across the fp time or the social media time or youtube time which is very much like you know significant you actually can use that time for a jog also although you don't realize that and uh, eating exercising sleep how much do you know about sleep hygiene and what you need to do to have a good sleep Are you having a regular bedtime routine? Do you take caffeine, tea closer to your bedtime? Do you take your phone or the laptop or the tab to bed so that ultimately your brain ends up associating bed as a place that you scroll the phone or use the tab rather than a place for sleep. So the sleep will nowhere be there. and uh 
uh, is there dim light or a nice calm sleeping environment for you to sleep stay positive and practice gratitude acknowledging the good parts of your day to day life now for example now if i get to know that somebody is really not liking me i'm going to feel a little bit upset obviously because we are human beings but have you taken time to think how many people that you don't really like like you know if you take as individuals there are people that you like and people that you dislike so we have given the advantage of not disliking and uh, we have given uh, taken the privilege of not liking certain people but we get rather annoyed and irritable when we find out that some other person does not like us now let's say a colleague when we are about to like talk work with that person we are kind of thinking okay this is the person who had said that thing but then we have also done the same thing we, and we are making ourselves stress thinking about that so look at the positives like you know just like i have the right to have my emotions and feelings those people also have the right to have emotions feelings likes and dislikes because that ultimately lead to stress because you don't want to work anywhere near that person if you did not know that fact and if you acknowledge the fact that i also have my preferences then the stress will be reduced this is something you can do in everyday life and you have to accept that you can't control everything and people have different capabilities now you know i might be a punctual person but the other person might not be a fun- punctual person in place of that i might be getting angry at people so i have this good quality as well as a bad quality just like that that person who gets late might be a good negotiator which is a positive thing so again don't focus on the negative things on ourselves or at the others because we are not perfect we have to come into that realization another place that we lack is the assertiveness but of course assertiveness is not anemata bad okay grand bad and continuously refusing to exchange duties that's not assertiveness you know that you can do this duty but just because you are saying no i can't but you might think that that's not going to generate stress but that is going to generate stress when your colleagues refuse to exchange duties with you so who created that stress i created that stress but on the other hand i have 8 to 2 duty today and 2 to 8 duty today and just because this person the friend has helped me in the past when my kid was sick and he or she asked for a exchange of duties night duties i say yes and now i am overwhelmed just because i was not assertive enough i should have been able to say i have this 8 to 2 duty i have this 2 to 8 duty and i don't think i'm going to be able to do this 8 to 8 duty because my baby is going to cry because she is not used to staying without me for a long time and then my mother will be calling me every hour disturbing me so that explanation you should be able to put it across to another person in a nice way without offending and if that particular person can't understand even that then that's not your problem but please not assertiveness is not being rude to other people you explain yourself without hurting the other person so those are some simple ways to prevent stress so in my talk today what i have focused is what stress is and although we tend to um uh label certain uncomfortable feelings as stress it might not be stress all the time and i have spoken certain situation that we create stress and exaggerate stress and i have given you some strategies to reduce stress in your day to day life and things that we unconsciously do uh, that lead to stress and i have told you that 
what you are experiencing or the you think it's stress might be anxiety or stress which needs attention although stress is not per se a psychiatric illness you need to sometimes come to the professionals if you are having maladaptive coping strategies and also if what you're feeling stressed because of a mental health issue thank you thank you very much uh, dr chatri for that interesting and very informative uh, very helpful lecture for all our doctors here and we have uh, a few questions to you uh, first question is nowadays most uh, of us tend to cling on to the mobile phones and dip into youtube and all and watching movies uh, does that prove to worsen stress explain the answer to some of that watching a movie is actually okay because most of the time what we do is we just waste time just scrolling from one page to another scrolling down the facebook and so on we are just doing aimlessly but let's say we want to take some me time and this is something that i enjoy so therefore for pleasure if i am watching a movie or listening to a mu- listening to a song that's perfectly all right that will reduce the stress but just aimlessly doing this and that that is going to waste your time and if you are comparing yourself and you know and going from one topic to another let's say now for example during covid time people tend to like you know browse a lot on covid and then they ended up getting more stressed so that is not going to be helpful thank you for that answer and the second one is uh, about patient care uh, how we can practice this at primary care settings uh, basically uh, when do you want to refer patient uh, uh, when we encounter that's a very good question uh, now um, i am assuming that they are talking about mental health issues and when there are unresolvable coping strategies and so on so basic principle that you can go by is if you don't have the expertise to do this better to refer let's say the patient is feeling sad having a lack of energy and all these things then you know that this is depression and you know what antidepressant to give then it's okay but of course please be mindful it's not merely about prescribing the antidepressant it's all it's also about if the patient is having comorbidities whether there are interactions because sometimes we have noted that you know there are problems like you know drugs with interactions just like you know have medscape or something like that and check the interactions because we actually expect uh primary care doctors to treat depression anxiety and also if you know how to help a person who is having problem solving issues then that's perfectly all right to do it because like now psychiatrists are becoming a rare species in the country so we are actually overwhelmed so we are more than happy for you to manage and and also if there are risks please refer the patients and uh, also now let's say um but uh, even with now let's say phobic phobia like you know a person is having snake phobia or something if you know what you are doing that's of course okay but then if you don't know what the strategy is then it's better to refer without taking a risk and um, also just don't go by symptoms because now let's say poor sleep a lot of people present with poor sleep it could be stress it could be anxiety it could be depression it could be schizophrenia so without going into details without diagnosing depression please don't pre- pre- prescribe alprazolam or clonazepam because the depression is not going to get better as well as the patient is going to end up with alprazolam dependence as well and there would be more problems there so you have to take the whole picture and then if you are competent enough and if you are uh, considering that this patient is not having any risk you are free to manage the patient thank you very much dr chaudhary for that very elaborative and very uh, thoughtful uh, answer and uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, again uh, with your busy schedules and we hope to you will join us again uh, with another topic thanks a lot and thank you all for joining us